Um, I would like to use uh, some of my time uh, this morning to highlight the words of Dr. Kristen Lyerly, who is a board certified uh, OBGYN and abortion care provider in Green Bay, Wisconsin. She says, um, imagine sitting in an exam room with your doctor explaining a very personal problem that is affecting every aspect of your life. And your doctor looks you in the eye and says, I know how to help you, but I can't because the politicians in our state won't let me. Physicians in Wisconsin have been forced to stop practicing medicine because of our state's restrictive abortion ban that was signed into law in 1849. You didn't hear me wrong, 1849. That was 70 years before women even had the right to vote. Instead of providing care to patients, they have to turn uh, patients away or consult with their lawyers, delaying critical care and wasting precious time. So, Dr. Brandy, what is the impact of delaying care in these critical situations? Thank you for the question. Delaying people's ability to access that care or delaying interventions in life-saving situations can be the line between life and death for some people. Um, as stated earlier, it's very unclear what these laws mean for providers on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for example, um, and I apologize for getting too technical, but let's use the example of someone breaks their water at 18 weeks, 19 weeks. It is very unlikely that pregnancy will continue to term or will have a good fetal outcome. But it's unclear based on this law with protections for the life of the mother, when are we allowed to intervene? Is it at that moment when typically I would have a conversation about, with that patient about what they want to do? Um, is it when that you know, broken water creates an infection? Is it when that patient becomes septic, when they're in, IC, in the ICU in shock? It's not written down anywhere what we do because we want to follow the standard of care, and that would be to intervene at that moment. But these laws don't really specify, and it's very confusing for the people on the ground that are trying to figure out, well, when can I intervene? And while waiting, this patient is getting sicker and sicker when they don't have to. That's not evidence-based care. And that's a scenario that many doctors are in right now. Thank you. Dr. Taylor, uh, can you describe how barring physicians from providing abortion care impacts access to other sexual and reproductive health care services? So for example, how does this affect families and um, affect those who are pregnant or looking to become pregnant? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, what comes to mind with this question is, you know, you do have some providers that are in situations where they're providing maternity care as well as abortion care. And so if they have to shutter, um, that means that the, the women in that community will not have access to the prenatal care that they need. Um, you know, we have seen this at the Century Foundation in particular. You know, we work with community-based organizations um, that are actually run and led by, you know, women of color serving the community on the front lines. Um, and some of those organizations are providing, you know, services um, both for abortion and maternity care. And so um, any, you know, facility that has to shutter its doors that's going to impact, you know, the comprehensive set of services that are available um, to folks in those communities. Thank you. Um, I, Dr. Brandy, this is uh, for you uh, also, uh, again. Uh, Wisconsin's law uh, provides that when an abortion is necessary to save a patient's life, this decision must be signed off on by two additional physicians. I'll add that, uh, that in Wisconsin, not even a cancer diagnosis or treatment for cancer falls under the exception for saving the life of the mother. That means in Wisconsin, three physicians have to come together, possibly in an emergency situation, to decide if a woman's life is worth saving, uh, because it's now required by the legislature in the state of Wisconsin. 
On Monday, the Biden administration released updated guidance on the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, or EMTALA, reminding doctors that they must terminate a pregnancy if doing so is necessary to stabilize a patient in an emergency medical situation. I want to thank the administration for this guidance, but I know that it is not a complete solution for the political interference that doctors are experiencing, and we need legislation for that. Dr. Brandy, can you explain why burdensome requirements to administer emergency care are so harmful? Thank you for the question. And just to briefly explain, EMTALA protects patients from being turned away from hospitals in emergent care settings, um, historically to protect people that were unable to pay. And so the requirement re requires emergency physicians to be able to assess a patient and potentially stabilize that patient if it's an emergency situation or transfer if that patient is unable to be get, get the proper care in that setting. The problem with EMTALA and its use right now within the abortion bans that exist is one, religious hospitals that may not provide abortion care um, can refuse and do not fall under the restrictions of EMTALA. And so many people seek care in these, in these facilities, and even if they have a life-threatening situation like um, breaking water early, hemorrhage, um, they don't necessarily have to follow under those rules. And the other thing with um, EMTALA is that, again, we're in the scenario that doctors are going to have to figure out amongst themselves, and it may be different depending on what hospital you're in, what is the stabilizing condition? What, how sick does someone have to be to consider that they fall under EMTALA or not? And there are going to be different scenarios, just like you're explaining, that many doctors are going to have to come to together and decide and figure that out. But it's unclear if we'll be protected. Like, how will we know if we're making the wrong choice?